Welcome to Startup Health TV. This is a COVID-19 health innovation update. It's a weekly check-in with Startup Health's Chief Medical Officer, Howard Krein. Dr. Howard Krein, um, really appreciate getting your perspective each week on your perspective there at Jefferson in Philadelphia. So Howard, thanks for, for joining me again. Thank you for having me again. I tell you, I really look forward to the, you know, even half hour to just reconnect and talk about what's going on because it really, it's changing day by day, not, not week by week, but, but sometimes even hour by hour. Yeah, so um, this is our third check-in and each week I ask you kind of what are you seeing there at the provider level, you're a surgeon at Jefferson in Philadelphia. What are you seeing at your facility and how has that changed in the last seven days? Yeah, so at our facility, um, what we're seeing is uh, probably a, a microcosm of what's going around in the country. Um, and that is uh, a lot of information that has to be digested on, uh, on really an hourly basis or a daily basis. Um, we're trying to stay ahead of the curve. We're trying to flatten the curve. Um, and we're trying to do what's right to protect AR patients, um, but also protect the healthcare providers, the hospital workers, staff, um, and the community in general. And interestingly enough, that changes um, day by day and hour by hour as well. How, how does the system, how do you uh, crunch the, that information as it comes out? I mean, is there like a, a stand-up meeting every morning of leaders? And I mean, how does that information get uh, pushed out? Yeah, well, I can tell you, um, we were just talking about this in the office today. Um, even though we are, we're almost at a patientless office now, so you would think that would mean that we have more time. Mm -hmm. um, because of this, uh, because of the, the pandemic, I think that we all have less time because we are spending so much time um, in meetings. And when I say that, I had, um, I had a meeting at 7 a.m., I had a meeting at 8 a.m., I had a meeting at 10 a.m., I had a meeting at 3 a.m. I'm having this call with you. I have one at 5.30 and I have one at 8.30. And each of these are different um, groups uh, that are talking, whether it's the hospital COVID response team, I'm, I'm on uh, one of the national COVID response teams. Um, I am on my departmental COVID response team. And literally all this information is coming in from multiple sources. You have to read the information, um, sort of get an understanding of what it means, the significance of it, uh, and then uh, drill it down to say, how is this going to change what we're doing? Interestingly enough, one of the things that, uh, that, that we're finding, um, so this is such a different time in medicine because generally in medicine, um, we rely on, um, on data that has been vetted. It's significantly been vetted. It's gone through peer review. We've done studies on it and you say, yeah. this is the results of the studies. Almost all of this information currently is anecdotal. It's all based on the experiences, whether it's in China, in Italy, or now in New York, that's helping guide the rest of the country. So how do you handle that? How do you vet that uh, in these various groups that you're a part of? So yeah, just very carefully. I mean, you have to sort of, again, you have to take all the information with a grain of salt and try to understand what you need to pull out of that information and what the consequences would be if you don't pull the right information. So when we talk about um, social distancing and its effects and, you know, when you hear, well, we might be getting to a point where it's re we're ready to relax it, um, you know, anecdotally, we say, you know what, that doesn't seem right. There is no hardcore evidence that okay. if we relax it, things aren't going to continue to get better. But, you know, your gestalt says, wait a second, this is working. This is not the time to relax things. Um, we as, a, as, as a, the medical providers have to sort of try to understand this and say, you know what, based on these patterns, based on the anecdotal evidence from China and from Italy and again from New York, we need to continue with, with this. The truth is only time will tell, but um, I think we mentioned last week there, there's no way to over-respond to this 
there is just an under response. Yeah. Uh, how do you translate these things that you're learning? You're on the front edge. You're getting this information for these national response groups. How do you translate some of that to patients? What do you tell patients right now about what's happening? Yeah. Well, well what we're telling patients is um, this is not a joke, that this is serious. I can tell you, um, uh, you know, I have my, uh, actually, um, uh, Scott Perlman, who's uh, our, my cousin, Stephen's mine, Barry's cousin, uh, is an ER doc at Einstein in New York. He is on the front lines. He's seeing it every day. And we're getting a good, um, uh, a good review almost daily from him of what's going on in New York. Really a, a firsthand view. And what he's saying is uh, the patients are getting younger and healthier. And so we're, where we were worried more uh, two weeks ago and saying, you know what, it's not affecting younger people. It's not affecting healthier people. Everybody just relax, be calm. It's, you know, 80% of us are going to be finding you. What they're seeing now is the, the new wave in New York is younger and healthier patients. And he just was telling us about a 29-year-old healthy guy um, who came in, guy was a marathon runner, and died within two days of uh, hitting the ER. Wow. And those, those, um, those stories are getting more common. So what we're telling our patients is, take no risk. You need to protect yourself. We, and if you, even if you think that you're going to be fine, you need to protect the people you love uh, and, and you know, love thy neighbor. You need to protect your neighbor. So stay in, socially isolate. Try to stay connected um, mentally through Zoom and you know Facebook and FaceTime and whatever whatever makes you feel connected, but stay apart from people. Be sure that if you go out um, right now in the hospital, we have everybody wearing masks. I don't think it's a bad idea to wear a mask when you're out in public. It helps if you are um, carrying something and don't know it from passing it. Um, there also is some indication that it might protect you a little bit, but more importantly, it's, it's just being proactive if you are infected and don't know it yet that you're not coughing, sneezing, breathing uh, onto other people. When you, work, when you work on these strategies at the hospital level and you're with other physicians and you're, you're talking about the strategy uh, among providers, do you feel like there's unity there uh, between the physician perspective and let's say the administrator perspective or even the, the political perspective? You know, there's, you have mayors and governors coming up with these plans and then you have physicians at the hospital level seeing it in reality. Uh, where do you see kind of um, unity and disconnects in that? So uh, I do think that, I think originally like in the beginning, there was a little bit more disconnect um, where the docs, I think, were a little bit more um, apt to say, wait a second, we need to really slow this down. I can tell you that we, um, as a department, went, uh, went to telemedicine medicine and um, tried to become patientless before it was um, required from the hospital. So I mm -hmm. think that um, every group is a little bit different. Um, but I think now... The overall, and I, I, you know, I, I speak to a lot of hospital administrators um, and they've been involved on the political level a little bit too. Uh, I think that we're seeing some unity in decision making and the understanding of the severity of this. I think people are also understanding that this is not, it's not a quick um, turnaround on this. This is still going to go on. I think that we're, if you look at the projections, um, you know, New York is is projected to peak this week to next week. Um, Philadelphia and some of the other cities are, 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 are um, thought to be peaking in the next two weeks. So we are still in the, right in the middle of this war, of this fight. This is no time um, to A, not support the front lines, and it's no time to start to loosen or lax the rules and the regulations that are going to protect uh, the citizens, the patients, and the providers. Yeah. Uh, just to shift gears a little bit, this week, Startup Health came out with something we were calling the COVID-19 Navigator, where, yeah. we're, where we're making it uh, really easy to search and find and collaborate with companies, with startups that have 
kind of reframed their product around COVID-19, trying to, trying to increase collaboration, trying to um, just speed up the whole process. Um, and just sort of thinking about ways that we can be you know, hopeful and see the, uh, the positive movement going on. What are your thoughts about that collaboration and the need for you know, just these entrepreneurs to be a part of this process? Yeah, I think it's it's imperative that entrepreneurs are part of the process. Listen, um, this is a no, novel virus. This is, um, as we all know, this is unprecedented. We've never lived through, uh, nor I don't think has anybody ever lived through a time like this. And I think that the only way that we're going to get through it uh, is with innovation. And certainly, you we see the innovation every day. I mean, the fact that we're having these conversations, if you look at uh, TV, the CNN and the uh, Fox and the MSNBC, they're all doing their, their job from home as mm -hmm. is most of the world right now. Um, and, you know, years ago, even if you go back two, three years ago, this would have been uh, impossible to do. Um, so innovation is going to be the way that we conquer this and uh, and move forward. I think that what we're what we've done at Startup Health with, Health with the COVID response um, uh, initiative is what we're trying to do is connect all the governors, all the different states, uh, anybody, hospital systems included that need um, solutions. We're trying to make it um, very easy for the companies uh, within Startup Health and without, without even outside of Startup Health to register with uh, the Startup Health COVID response team and um, allow government and um, private industry, hospital systems to search our database and quickly connect with the solutions that they're going to need and help them um, to get those solutions to the proper uh, places, whether it's the hospital systems um, or uh, patients at home. Yeah. You know, I know you've done a fair amount of medical missions o over the years, and, and I wonder if you've been thinking recently just about how, how this is going to hit some developing markets, uh, some under-resourced areas, uh, maybe even places that you've worked in the past. Yeah, well, I think that anytime that you make access to medical care easier, um, we're affecting not only you know the United States and, um, and developed countries, but we're, we're really... A, eventually affecting uh, third world countries and really um, uh, places that need this access. The fact that we're doing it digitally and, you know, the, 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 the ability to do telemedicine, um, even though I'm doing it within my state and it actually across some state lines too, the government was nice enough to extend um, the uh, medical licensing so that you, it didn't matter what state you're in. If you're licensed in one state, you can do telemedicine into another. Mm -hmm. Um, but the fact that I can do that means that I can also do it, um, in Belize. As a matter of fact, I had a, a zoom call earlier today with one of the patients that I've treated in Belize, Belize that, um, has uh, developed a little infection. I was able to see the, you know, the mother was uh, able to, to uh, take some pictures, they sent it over to me. I zoomed with one of the doctors that's over there, and we're getting that patient treatment. So, yeah. you know, the fact that we're innovating and changing the way healthcare is delivered uh, is going to um, hopefully improve medicine and healthcare around the globe. I mean, a lot of ink has been spilled about telemedicine having its moment here in the United States, but I don't think we've even scratched the surface for um, the global impact, like you just said. I mean, the idea that you would be consulting with someone in Belize and relieving some of the pressure uh, the, in terms of access in that way, I mean, you take that idea and you, you know, multiply it by a million and you've changed the entire equation. Yeah, well, one of the interesting things that... Uh you know, uh, one of the interesting th statistics, I think, is uh, I was in India a few years back and one, we, were, we were traveling and touring and, you know, we were in some of the really, just really ho horribly devastated, um, economically devastated areas. And one of the things that you noticed was, uh, although most, most places didn't have running water, um, they most places had at least one person within 
the in the household that had a cell phone mm -hmm. and so and not even a cell phone a smartphone sure. um per you know per the uh you know the person we, we were going around with and i think that that's telling i think that um you know the ability of the entire world to connect now uh is in unprecedented also and i think that we're going to be able to really because of this uh pandemic forcing our hand i think we're going to hopefully be able to improve the health and wellness of everyone that's a good one. Uh, it's, it's a good note. Um, you know, how, how do you think the next week's going to look for you there in Philadelphia? I mean, wh what are you doing to anticipate what, what are concrete steps you're taking to prepare? Yeah, so I can tell you we've had some great uh, progress here. We now finally, um, it used to take five days to get a test result. We are now uh, about 24 hours and we just got in the 15 minute test. Um, although with the 15 minute test, the, the downside to that is it only, you can only run one test at a time. So you're not gonna be able to push through a bunch of tests, but if you need a quick answer um, on somebody who has to go to the operating room um, or is gonna be exposed, if you have to put them on a ventilator or, uh, and, or do uh, some kind of oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal um, uh, surgery, will be protected. So um, there's good things there. I think that we are continuing, and the, the important part is continuing to socially isolate, to protect patients and protect hospital workers. I think that's also the biggest thing, yeah. is recognizing um, that this is, a, this is a unique moment in time where truly our healthcare workers are at a at a, at a very dangerous place. We do not, definitively, we do not have uh, enough uh, personal protective equipment for everyone. Um, I have a mask for the OR and a, a N95 mask for the OR that I've been using all week um, that I'll use uh, tomorrow I operate uh, and then hopefully I'll get a new one for next week, but I don't know. Um, I'll keep it until uh, until we, we, we need to, but um, you know, the days of having enough personal protective equipment are gone right now. And yeah. so it's, uh, you know, we're just continuing to do what we do, try to stay as, as healthy and protected as possible, and, and can you continue taking care of the patients. What, what message do you send to your staff? I mean, it's, like, it's one thing to take that risk on yourself, but when you're, when you're managing a team or when you're speaking to somebody else, how do you talk to them about that lack of equipment? Well, I think that the the important thing is for for everybody on the team to understand that we're all in this together. Um, not one person in the team is more important than the other. Um, we make sure that if we have um, a patient that is either undiagnosed or positive, that everybody has the appropriate protective um, uh, equipment, um, including you know the people who you know there, there's there's everything from right the providers the staff the nurses but also there's housekeeping there's people who need to clean the room we need to protect everybody yeah. <clears throat> so it's just about communication letting people know that we're you know as as the leadership wouldn't ask anybody to do uh anything that they wouldn't do themselves and i yeah. think that that is uh that's sort of helping us get through it now Right now in Philly, we're, we're, I don't want to say we're, we're lucky, but we are lucky in that we are nowhere near um, what uh, New York is, is uh, going through right now. Yeah. It's, it is a, the true front lines in New York. And, uh, you know, my, my heart and, uh, and thoughts and prayers go out to all the providers that, that, are, that are there. Yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Kryan, that's a good note to end on. We will see uh, where things are at. About a week from now, I'll, I'll check in with you again. And uh, once again, thank you for your, for your time and your, all your work there on the front lines uh, in Philadelphia. Thank you, Logan. I look forward to talking to you again next week. All right. Be well and uh, be healthy. Stay safe. Take care. Right. Take care.